first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Hermes, Dr. Gandhi, for um, and the organizers for uh, allowing me to be here with you all and to present uh, this topic. It's a true honor to be here. And uh, these are my disclosures. So the story of adults with congenital heart disease, we all have heard this story. Uh, an adult shows up in the ER, and when the resident is presenting the history to you or the medical student, um, often there's a line, this patient was lost to follow up for 20 years or 10 years or five years and so on and so forth. And so we focused a lot on that. Um, and there have been a lot of initiatives of late focusing on educating adult congenital heart disease patients uh, with transitional and transfer of care programs. This is a very uh, elegant study uh, published in um, Jack in 2018. And this was actually a nurse-led intervention, a very interesting study. Um, and they actually showed that with this nurse-led intervention, they could reduce the likelihood of delay in adult congenital heart disease care and improve congenital heart disease knowledge and self-management skills in this uh, population. Very important to do. But what I want to fo uh, focus on in this talk is, what about us, the provider? Do we need to educate ourselves? And what have we learned along the way? So what do we know uh, about uh, the patient population that we're dealing with? You saw some slides from uh, Dr. Penny this morning. And so this was one of the first articles by Roberta Williams and uh, looking at the uh, number of patients with adult congenital heart disease and, and how that has changed over time. And in 2000, it was estimated that there were a total of uh, 787,000 adults with congenital heart disease. And in that same year, there were 623,000 um, uh, children. Some of you may have seen this graphic, which um, is interpreted from um, that study as well. In 1965, 70% of the population we were dealing with were pediatric patients, um, and it moved to about 50-50 in 1985. Uh, and in 2005, uh, for the first time, there were 1 million adults estimated to have uh, uh, adults with congenital heart disease versus 600,000 children. And you saw the number most recently in 2010, uh, or so uh, of 1.4 million that Dr. Penny quoted this morning. What do we know about catheterization of adults with congenital heart disease? So this was a study uh, looking at the trends in U.S. cardiovascular care. This was published in Jack in 2017. And they looked at all, all comers. Uh, these are adults with and without congenital heart disease. And there were 20,000 procedures uh, performed in pediatrics and adult, in, in children and adults with congenital heart disease. And if you look at papers around that time, roughly in pediatric hospitals, 15 to 20% of patients are actually adults with congenital heart disease. The adverse event rate you can see here was about 2.8% um, uh, in, in the initial cohort and 1.8% um, uh, in 2014. And that compared to quite high adverse event rates when you look at patients less than a month of age. So certainly adults are uh, being uh, catheterized uh, quite often, and the adverse event uh, rate is acceptable. Uh, this is another way of looking at that. Uh, this is an article published in the European Heart Journal looking at prediction of adverse events, and say they also, in, this, in their article, uh, found an adverse event rate of 2.5%, very similar. Um, and they use that um, uh, a scoring system to predict which patient would actually uh, develop an, or um, be exposed to an adverse event rate. And a number of um, uh, variables were uh, uh, put into the model that were effectively able to predict uh, whether an adult with congenital heart disease would have an adverse event in the cath lab or not. So again, if there's one uh, take home message uh, from my talk, it's what does asymptomatic really mean? What does doing reasonably well really mean? And are we being falsely reassured by the compensated adult congenital heart disease patient? How many of us have gone into a room, I'll raise my hand first, and have seen an adult with congenital heart disease who's a little obese uh, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and wondered, is it just age? Are they out of shape? Is it their heart? Um, so um, it's something that we, we uh, deliberate with um, often. And, I really think that we've really not had enough data to actually measure physiologically what is, what is going on with their um, circulation at that time. So I'm going to uh, illustrate this with a few examples um, uh, that, that really highlight this point that I'm trying to make. So baffle obstructions in, in patients with mustard are, uh, operations are, are quite common. This is a 41-year-old gentleman with detransposition of the uh, great arteries. You know, when a op mustard operation in 1978 uh, by Dr. Cooley here. 
He had been followed for mild baffle stenosis and controlled atrial tachycardias. These, this mild baffle stenosis, he had been catheterized actually <laughs> twice at very reputable institutions. And was both of the reports said this baffle stenosis is mild. Uh, the gradients are mild. And, uh, you know, it's probably the fact that maybe he's out of shape. Uh, he's, he's got some mild uh, baffle obstruction and he's, and he's uh, overweight. He has some fatigue. Uh, he was obese and he was not interested in work at all. Lack of motivation. This is something very common, as, as all of you know, who take care of adults with congenital heart disease. It's really heartbreaking to see these patients. Um, they're really suffering at work. Their family life suffers. So there's a huge psychological component to this. I'm going to pause here because I do want to give credit to my adult congenital uh, heart disease uh, colleagues, Dr. Ermas, Dr. Lamb, Dr. Opina, um, Dr. Broda, Dr. Price, the entire team here. When they call me and they say, look, uh, this patient has mild symptoms, but really the tests are not showing that, uh, that, that there's anything going on with them. More often than not, they're right. Um, and, uh, you know, they've, uh, they've, 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 they're spot on with, with their, um, with their uh, diagnosis. There are limitations in the test, testing of these patients. So one may wonder, this is a patient who's been catheterized twice. Uh, there was mild baffle obstruction. In fact, this patient was cathed a year or so before we cathed him here. And at the time, the gradient or the pulmonary venous baffle gradient was only uh, eight or 10. Um, but they had only gotten wedge pressures. And why is that? Well, many of you know this circulation is actually difficult uh, to uh, obtain a, a true pulmonary venous pressure. When you have baffle stenosis in the pulmonary venous atrium, there are actually two chambers you're trying to get at. And this is against uh, intuition. Normally, we puncture leftward and posterior. But you can see here the pulmonary venous uh, atrium is actually rightward and anterior. So nobody had ever been in this patient's pulmonary venous atrium. Nobody had a clue what this patient's pulmonary venous atrial pressure was. So we did trans baffle uh, puncture. And this patient who, had, uh, who was in his 40s and not feeling well at work, his pulmonary venous baffle pressure was 30 millimeters of mercury. And I didn't believe it first. I said, it can't be. Re-zeroed multiple times, rechecked the transducers, and it ranged from 26 to 30 millimeters of mercury. There's no way this patient is asymptomatic. There's no way that his symptoms are mild. Um, so we um, went ahead and uh, stented the baffle. And as you know, this can be challenging to do because uh, it's like uh, um, robbing Peter to pay Paul. These baffles are close together. If you stent the SVC limb, you may crush the pulmonary venous baffle. So we wire actually both of them. And you can see here uh, in this view here, you can see an on fos view of that pulmonary venous baffle that we've stented here. Um, and with newer techniques, this can now be done transcatheter. In the past, uh, people had done it either surgically or hybrid techniques. Um, but with the new techniques we have and experience, you can really get in there and see what's going on with these uh, patients. This here is the pulmonary venous baffle right here. Let me let it play. And on top, you're right, this is the systemic so, venous baffle. So you're saying there's stenosis in both? There was stenosis in both. That's correct. Thank you for asking that question. And, um, and you can see here, there's stenosis being relieved of the superior limb of that baffle. So this patient, uh, my good friend, Dr. Lamb, gave me feedback uh, a month later. You know, everybody's got their thing. Everybody's got their interest. Uh, this, this patient, uh, this patient uh, enjoyed Nerf gun wars. Um, and this is, the, this is the message that I got back. Mr. C went from playing Nerf gun war for five minutes and getting tired to now 40 minutes with energy. Jogging again, has not missed work school, wanted to quit prior to the stents being placed. So that really hammers home the message, um, at least to me. I, I think that you know th these patients really need our help. I think Dr. Ermis mentioned that. These patients really need our help. Uh, you know They have been um, survivors and uh, uh, oftentimes, uh, oftentimes their symptoms may not be apparent to themselves, people around them, or us. This is another lady who had, we'll talk a little bit about percutaneous pulmonary valve placement. She was a 38-year-old with an AV septal defect <coughs> and a hypoplastic RV with tetralogy of Fallot. She had an initial shunt that was done by Dr. Cooley, a balloon pulmonary blast, uh, uh, valvioplasty, another shunt by Dr. Cooley, um, and then AV septal defect repair with a homograph being uh, placed as well. And on top of that, emergent left AV valve replacement. She had mild fatigue, again, similar to the last patient, nothing uh, out of the ordinary. And the MRI really wasn't that remarkable. You know, RV and diastolic volume index of 140, it's up there, but certainly not the largest that we've seen. RVEF slightly diminished. 
and her QRS was not wide. This is an example of what these look like. You can see here. Um, uh, this is the melody valve going up in a pre-stented area, and afterwards her conduit stenosis and regurgitation has gone. This patient presented to clinic and said she had mild fatigue. The people around her said she, well, she's only mildly winded, I think. And we actually even contemplated, maybe we can wait a little bit. This is the message I got back. Mrs. B feels world's better. These are her, word, her, her words uh, that were um, uh, relayed to me by uh, Dr. Lam. Her exact words were, I feel alive now. So uh, it's truly remarkable. This is another patient with multivalve dysfunction, 45-year-old born with pulmonary atresia and type ventricular septum. She had a shunt in England, then a, a tricuspid valvotomy and a con RB2P, a conduit again in England. Her subsequent operations were done here in the United States. So this lady, this 45 lady has, has, has been through it all. She's had multiple reoperations. Um, she was admitted for um, uh, right heart failure. She also has, has a history of atrial tachycardias. And this is what her fluoroscopy looks like. You can see here, she's got pacing lead. She's got two bioprosthetic valves. And we were, it, the question was brought up to us, well, one of the valves may be small. Maybe she should have surgery. We do have techniques, though, that we, that we are going to need to apply as interventional cardiologists to these patients to um, help them get through these difficult procedures. So uh, the paper there I showed you was just uh, an experience showing um, uh, the experience with intentional frame fractures. And here's the balloon going up. The reason I'm showing this is that we're going to be faced with more and more of these patients in the future. And you can see there, there's a sudden give and snap there. If you look closely, you'll see here at 2 o'clock, that's where the ring has been broken. And so we can re-expand that. We've done this now in a number of patients, place a valve. This patient also got a tricuspid valve in the cath lab, and she has more energy. At the first uh, month visit, she had lost 10 pounds. Uh, a lot of it was fluid uh, from her right heart failure. So what, is the, what, is the, what lies in the future for us? Well, here's the last case I'm going to show about what, uh, how I think, uh, uh, what I think we're going to be dealing with in the future. This is a 16-year-old, but for that matter, it, it could be uh, a 20-year-old, 30-year-old in the future. These are the patients we're going to be seeing who had an unbalanced canal at a number of operations that uh, culminated in a non-fenestrated Fontan in 2009, had a dilated aortic root with progressive AI that was severe, heart failure symptoms, VT, LV thrombus, um, and was approved by um, our MRB for listing, was not felt to be an operative candidate. Uh, these are the patients we're going to be seeing in the future. We really need to be thinking hard and uh, hard about these uh, uh, these patients. So also had a history of fungal uh, infection, AKI, left septic knee. Uh, so it's no surprise that um, our surgical team felt like um, uh, there were not many good options, or at least there wasn't a good bailout if the if the aortic valve was replaced. So uh, here is his uh, aortic root angiogram. We actually uh, got these nice uh, images from. Um, uh, reconstructed CT images that showed us that we could possibly do this in the cath lab. This patient also had a Fontan, so pacing uh, during valve deployment would have been difficult. Uh, we do go across baffles if we need to, but it certainly adds time to the procedure. So with our EP colleagues, we're actually able to pace through the wire by uh, grounding to the skin. You can see the patient's head is this way. And uh, here you can see the valve going up. In the interest of time, I'll just show the, the, the final picture. You can see here it's far away from the coronary arteries. We actually had to revalve it due to valve stability, but the patient looked well afterwards, um, and uh, the coronaries are far away. But we'll be seeing more and more of these patients in the future uh, for sure. So in conclusion, I think many patients with uh, adult congenital heart disease are, are more symptomatic than they and we appreciate. I think newer techniques have facilitated a number of, uh, of innovative interventions for these patients. And I think by virtue of these newer, innovative, uh, less um, invasive procedures, we're now really realizing the optimal timing of intervention in these patients. And I think we must be prepared for the challenging landscape as a new substrate of ACHD patients emerges. So we've been talking about the mustards and, and so on, and, uh, but what about the arterial switch patients when they get 50, 60 with coronary artery disease? Uh, aortic, uh, neo aortic root dilation. We really need to be prepared to deal with those patients. It's a whole separate population we're going to have to deal with. Lots of people to thank, um, and uh, without that, it wouldn't have been possible. Thank you.